Ngongi has the professional capacity to deliver on your external and internal audit assurance requirements. Visit ngongi.com for more. Welcome back. I'm Mervyn and I discussing the qualities needed for a good director and an excellent chairman with our special guest, Rul Koza, chairman of Nedbank. So Mervyn, is it an urban myth that some directors don't even read their company's annual report? Not at all. It's a reality, unfortunately, um, but uh, it's changing and, uh, and I'll give you the reason. That uh, there has really been no system for a hundred years of preparing the annual report. Um, the annual report was really the job of the company secretary. So the company secretary would ask the human resource director to give the report on the human resource and the CFO to give a report on the financial situation, etc. And then sort of belt the one on the other. That's why you've got these different styles in the, in the annual report. And my experience has been in chairing boards when something happens, um, and I know it's in the annual report, I will say to a director, um, Mr. Jones, um, what do we say about that again in the annual report? And you get this glazed look in, in the eyes. But ask the company secretary. <laughs> Is that a secretary, mean chairman's trick? <laughs> you ask the company secretary and they know immediately. But now with integrated thinking and the integrated report, the board just has to spend more time understanding the financial report, understanding the so-called non-financial aspects or sustainability report in order to extract the material matter and put it in clear, concise and understandable language in the integrated report. So there is a system now of the collective mind being applied to these issues. Rul, how do you check that every one of your directors has A, read the annual integrated report and B, read the agenda pack for meetings and the board pack? I mean, sometimes it's absolutely huge, it's like a thick, a thick book. Undoubtedly. Um, what uh, I, I found to be helpful is to introduce a culture of active involvement uh, and that you do yes, essentially by uh, addressing a number of uh, challenges. The board typically would have uh, a number of uh, subcommittees. At subcommittee level people drill a lot deeper and even those that are typically um, you know, passengers by the time they come to the board, that particular dimension that they actually have to deal with at committee level, they know something about. And what I do is uh, typically have um, uh, a number of board members serve on a number of committees. So there's also cross-pollination where that is concerned. And as chairman, you also, uh, if you wait for the people who will actually indicate they want to say something, uh, they shall be passengers. So where I am concerned, I don't, uh, I typically don't even ask the one who wants to talk. I pounce. And people know that uh, they'll be <laughs> pounced upon. So that's another a, mean table a, a, trick a where you bit, pounce on A people. bit of peer pressure yeah. does some of the tricks that actually need to, to be done. But if you're preparing, say for an AGM, given that lately you have uh, shareholder activists, uh, board members, uh, know that in fact they get invited and when you chair the AGM there are also times when you ask them to elaborate so they tend to also prepare mm. a lot more and uh, in instances of those also you make sure that there is a Q&A uh, session that actually makes everybody you know fully prepared so I think it's, it's, it's a question of the architecture as well as the culture that you, 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 you cultivate but is it fair to, to expect um, the average director to know the ins and outs of a complicated banking transaction which they've had to vote on? You Say a really complex financial derivative. You certainly have, have to. You have to be financially literate. Um, but otherwise, I mean, you don't belong. Uh, and then secondly, you also have to have a strategic mind that understands that, you know, technically you may not know all of the technical things and the technical issues uh, at hand, but you must know the essence. You must be able to relate and relate wisely and intelligently. So where that is concerned, there shall be no compromise. Nathan? Well, I think uh, the, the answer to me lies in the, to move away from the natural human inclination of being afraid to say, I do not understand 
please Mr. Chief Executive explain to me what this means. I've read the pact but I don't understand it. It's to me uh, at many board meetings I have we have discussed an issue and for 30 minutes whatever it is and you go around the table do you agree and everybody agrees to the resolution I will I'll use your word, pounce on, <laughs> on, on a direct and say, will you please now motivate in great detail why you voted yes. Mm. Now, if that director hasn't really understood the yeah. pack and hasn't yeah. understood the discussion, he sits there with a second row of teeth and I'll tell you, just get the level of how we're improving. Your directors must be shivering at the knees every time they walk into your boardroom. <laughs> no, after no, after a while, the, the culture of reading and preparation actually sets in. And yes, you you've, got to, you've got to get that You've culture. got to get that yeah. cultivated. Yeah. And in, in particularly with a, with a bank's board, I mean, it's, uh, it's very, very detailed. Uh, what we do is uh, make sure that the chief executive actually distributes a chief executive's report that actually flags all of the important issues. Uh, initially, it used to be very, very thick. And we said, you know, give us the essence. And if there are directors who don't fully understand what's going on, they have an opportunity to actually quiz the chief executive, spend some time with the chief executive. But before as the meeting. Well before. Yeah. In fact, they can yeah. call on him at any time. Mm. They can call on the other executives at any time and drill a little deeper. And but isn't that, I mean, Mervyn, you, when we were writing our book, you, you referred to the grey area. So should directors really have an access to all of those executives, well, direct uh, uh, access? Certainly companies which I chaired, I didn't like just carte blanche because a director has the right to go and inquire. Yeah. I used to certainly. prefer the non-executive to come through me, you know, to, uh, and I would talk to the chief executive to make sure that the non-executive director wasn't interfering with the flow of management or mm. some critical or important issue that they were handling with. Unfortunately, you do find the non-executive director who could previously been a chief executive of a company or thinking that he or she knows better than the manager and they will go straight to the manager. <laughs> you know, straight to the manager and say, I know you're doing this contract, but now let me just tell you my experience. And and that poor manager doesn't know, you know who, he's, yeah. who he's really reporting to. So, so you get what I call a grey director. And then uh, that's dangerous. And it does really depend um, on, on the chairman. I mean, do you allow your non-execs to approach di your exec directors directly? We, we do, but uh, uh, caution that, in fact, they are not in there to tell them how the world is structured. Uh, yeah. But to it's help better understand mm -hmm. uh, how the company mm -hmm. operates. And uh, in the majority of cases, in fact, uh, a good number of them are balanced. But as Mervyn says, there are those who are former chief executives and they never disengage. Uh, they're just like the pugilist <laughs> who, who boxes in the to. ring and outside <laughs> of the ring. Okay, so you're both very experienced a chairman of companies with, with many pearls of wisdom. What makes a top-notch chairman role? I might be somewhat self-serving, but uh, I'd like to be objective. I think first, a good chairman has got to have a sense of destiny. It's not important to be just technically sound. Why are you here? What difference might you make? A sense of destiny that helps you define your sense of destination. And from that, you define the sense of vision, both personal vision and the corporate vision. Uh, the the, the uh, ideal uh, uh, chairman will actually have that, but will also understand that as a chairman, he probably is first amongst equal. And in terms of preparation, in terms of reading, in terms of understanding the milieu, both internal and external, in, ter in terms of understanding the kinds of things that make for the complexity of the environment in which uh, the chairman is operative, he goes the extra mile in terms of uh, preparation. But very, very importantly, he must be a good communicator. And a good communicator actually listens first and foremost, seeking first to understand the others before he, disp he dispenses whatever pearls of wisdom mm. he might have by way of directing the session or the process. And I find that um, those are the kinds of chairmen who actually extract the most from their uh, um, colleagues, amongst whom they're just first amongst equals and not necessarily more knowledgeable than all of them. Yeah. Mervyn? Well, I, I think a good chairman has got to be a good listener. He should mm. be the last person to speak. 
And not only that, he or she has got to understand the strengths and weaknesses of the various board members. If there's an important issue on the agenda, I would phone the director two or three days before the board meeting and say, have you read your pack? Yes. I think the critical issue is item number five. I want you to go to into it in great detail. Google, Wikipedia, do what you like, just because I'm going to call on you to start the discussion. And the reason for that is you just get the discussion starting on a more informed level. And logically, you should come up with a better business judgment decision. So you've got to be a good listener. You've got to know the strengths and weaknesses of people in your boardroom. And very importantly for a chairman is to make sure the agenda, that he's got the critical issues on the agenda. And I have found as a chairman, rulers use the word destiny. I use the word long-term vision. You've got to keep that long-term vision constantly in your mind because obviously you're making short-term and medium-term decisions. But you've got to think of how is that going to fit in, you know, with the that long-term vision because the board is there making decisions that you've got to be constantly aware of it. And the, the other thing is, whether one likes it or not, the chairman is the image of the company. The public image. Yes. Yeah. Public, and, and um, you know, over and above uh, the knowledge, uh, as public image, you also have to, n to have the necessary moral authority. Mm -hmm. There is a sense in which uh, ethical behavior. Yeah, absolutely. You have to ethical be leadership. Cleaner than is, clean. Yeah, you got you strive to do that. You yeah. may not be perfect, but you've got to strive to be fully exemplary. We're running out of time. It's been so interesting, but I must ask you as very experienced directors, what is your advice to um, people like me who want to become a director? Well, uh, first of all, I think there's some very good courses, not because Rule and I are president and vice president of the Institute of Directors, but there are very good courses at the IRD today on directors. And we have followed the Institute of Directors of the UK, and we now are permitted uh, to, uh, SACWA has permitted us to give the diploma status of chartered director. So there is an examination which you can write. And if you pass it and you pass the, the three governors, as Roy Anderson, Rule and myself, we interview you and we give you the designation Chartered Director. Quick final comment from you, Rule. I think um, Mervyn has covered that. Um, in addition to that, you know, becoming a good director, uh, well-informed, uh, you actually have to, re to hitch your uh, start to a given wagon. Uh, mentorship uh, is still a very, very important practice and an adjunct to the formal training. Um, and more often than not, you don't actually hit your uh, start to just one wagon. You learn from a variety of people who have been at it and uh, integrate that into your learning as you go along. Yeah, you learn from your elders. Correct. Thank you so much, Rule. Thank you, Mervyn. Great Pleasure. stuff. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. And thank you so much for joining us. We'll be chatting about another hot topic in doing business in today's world in next week's program. Until next time, bye. Now is the time for change. Doing business in the 21st century was proudly brought to you by Ngongi, the external and internal audit assurance providers. Log on to ngongi.com.